On June 28, 1969, in Greenwich Village, a bastion for New York City's gay community, a riot broke out after police raided the popular Stonewall Inn. The demonstration became the catalyst for the modern LGBTQ movement in the United States. It immediately led to organizing and the formation of gay rights groups in New York City, and the first New York Pride March occurred on the anniversary of the riot in 1970. This is Caitlin Phillips with the Oxford Comment. Our episode today features two interviews with Oxford University Press authors on the convergence of LGBTQ culture and art, especially in the aftermath of Stonewall and other movements focusing on gay rights in the late 1960s and 1970s. Our first guest is Elizabeth Woolman, Associate Professor of Music at Baruch College and the author of Hard Times, the adult musical in 1970s New York City. She is here with us to talk about the impact of the Stonewall Riots and the LGBTQ movement on theater in New York City, from mainstream Broadway musicals to off-off-Broadway theater. Welcome to the Oxford Comment. I'm your host, Caitlin Phillips. Today we have Elizabeth Woolman with us. Could you introduce yourself for us? Hi, yeah, I'm Elizabeth Wallman. I'm a professor of music at Baruch College, City University of New York, and I'm on the doctoral faculty at the Graduate Center in the theater department, also at CUNY. Um, I'm the author of a couple of books about the musical theater. The one that relates to this discussion is Hard Times, the adult musical in 1970s New York City, and I'm happy to be here. Great, thank you. We're happy to have you. Um, So starting off, If you could just give us an idea, your book is set, obviously, in the 70s. Could you Mm -hmm. give us any kind of insight into maybe what the scene looked like before uh, 1970? um, Sure. And what would have been expected, you know, before 1970? Sure. Um, So broadly speaking, the book is is really about the sexual revolution, which started in uh, really in the late 1960s. Uh, The book is about the way that the sexual revolution influenced Uh, musicals on and off and off off Broadway in New York City in the 1960s and 70s. So really, it sort of spans that time. Now, regarding Stonewall, uh, the work that I did was essentially looking at uh, the period um, slightly before Stonewall, before the years of Stonewall, and then following Stonewall, what happened to the theater uh, as it was reflected, or at least the musical as it was reflected following the Stonewall years. So um, before Stonewall, it's kind of important to understand that there was plenty of activism that was going on. Uh, It's kind of important to understand that Stonewall was not sort of a spontaneous eruption. It was not something that just generated out of nowhere. It was the culmination of a lot of unfair treatment in New York City, across the country, in terms of the ways that LGBTQ people were treated, uh, their lack of agency, and certainly under the law, and their um, lack of equal treatment. And so, in a great many ways, the Stonewall riots were the kind of a, a point of redirection, I think, for a population that had long been working against particular strictures and trying to move beyond them, um, it certainly did redirect the movement in certain ways. Now, before the Stonewall riots happened in 1969, there was actually a very active off-off Broadway scene that was happening in lower uh, Manhattan during the, starting actually in the very late 50s, but really snowballing through the 1960s. Uh, initially in a small cafe that was known as the Cafe Chino, um, which was founded by Joe Chino, who was its owner and proprietor. He also ended up being an active theatrical producer, but he bought a small um, coffee place, a tiny little hole-in-the-wall restaurant. It's now a restaurant. It was a, um, uh, it, it was a tiny little kind of coffee house, and he put a beat-up cappuccino maker in it, and he invited a lot of his friends to come and make art, to make theater, to do dance. Um, And so essentially, and Joe Chino was gay, he was openly gay, and many of his friends were gay and lesbian, and so there was a lot of activity that started in really as as early as the very early 60s, late 1950s, um, in and around the Cafe Chino, which was on Cornelia Street um, in the West Village. And 
he really, in a lot of ways, is credited, his space is kind of credited with the beginning, not only of the off-off Broadway movement, but in a lot of ways of gay theater making, certainly in New York City, um, which had not yet kind of concentrated. Now, before the Cafe Chino, before the off-off Broadway scene, and certainly before Stonewall, when it came to mainstream representations of gay and lesbian people, it was very often, this was very often um, theater productions, both musicals and, and non, that were aimed at a mainstream audience, uh, presumably not a LGBTQ audience, but sort of a larger mainstream audience in which uh, people that were gender non-normative were kind of there for for laughs. Like they were, you know, there was the fop role and the the nonce role and various different roles that were kind of um, exaggerated stereotypes of uh, present, you know, exaggerated stereotypes of of LGBTQ life um, that were really done either for laughs or as morality tales. So generally, there would either be somebody that was just kind of a clown that was there to be to be mocked for their effeminacy or for their or for their masculinity or what have you. Um, but on the other hand, there was also uh, history through, I mean, as early as the, the teens and the 20s and probably that went back much earlier, of characters that would for example you know act on their on their deeply sinful urges and as a result would either be punished by the end so there would either be some kind of suicide or they they would die as a result of this or on the other hand they would uh, wake up one day, realize that they had sinned and they had they they had gone in the wrong direction, and then they would fix their lives, and that was kind of construed as a happy ending, right? Uh, so this was a long history of this kind of representation, certainly in the mainstream. So what the Cafe Chino and then the um, the rest of the off off Broadway movement, and I would say in the off off Broadway movement, the Cafe Chino kind of spawned the theater, the Playhouse of the Ridiculous, and the Judson Poets uh, Theater, and Cafe La Mama, and then along further down the road, um, the Wow Cafe, a number of different avant-garde and experimental spaces that focused more on um, LGBTQ people and the community. And what Stonewall did was, I think, precipitate. I mean, in some ways, Stonewall. What th this stuff was already happening off off Broadway before Stonewall. Um, but Stonewall in 1969, in a lot of ways, helped redirect the movement, redirect the LGBTQ movement. Uh, first of all, to be slightly more inclusive, to be more open to various different kinds of gender difference, but also uh, in the long run to move from activism that was covert, a little bit more covert and a little bit more aimed at uh, the cult of personality. So for a long time, there were movements like the Belitis, uh, the Matachin Society, in which there were these very quiet, covert sort of um, – uh, yeah, uh, quiet, covert movements where people would get together and they would talk about the fact that they felt different than everybody else. And there was sort of uh, uh, networks that were more about reassuring one another that they weren't crazy, that they did, that there were other people like them, that there was community to be found. The Stonewall riots caused a lot more of an organization along the lines of civil the civil rights movement, which in some ways it was influenced by. So following the Stonewall riots, there was immediately much more in the way of open organizing, uh, the desire to take things to the streets, the desire to take things to the courts, um, and to really activate for uh, equal rights, and that did eventually also start to reflect itself in mainstream and certainly in experimental spaces even more so than it did. And can you talk a little bit maybe about if musical theater changed at all? Stonewall, and, and as you're sort of saying, all of this activism is coming to the forefront. Did it right. change the topics that musicals were approaching? Did it change maybe who was cast in the musicals? What maybe was the impact then on musical theater? So basically, when it comes to musical theater, and I would say um, essentially, basically the off and off-off-Broadway 
year continued to do an awful lot of what it had started doing just before Stonewall. So Stonewall, probably the the biggest um, show to come out of the off-off Broadway movement um, during the late 1960s, which actually preceded Stonewall by a year, was Mart Crowley's Boys in the Band, which is a very well-known production. It just had its Broadway premiere a year ago, which actually kind of tells you how slowly things work in some ways. Um, so that was not a musical. That was a play, but it was fairly groundbreaking in the sense that even a year before Stonewall, it kind of went against the model of um, gay characters being used just as comic relief or gay characters having to die or make themselves straight magically somehow by the end of the show in order to find redemption. Um, Boys in the Band was a show about a group of gay men and they live their lives and they have a night of partying and it kind of, they, they you know, they yell at one another and some people leave angry and some people are fine, but they all get up the next day and they're the same people. And it's just really a, de a depiction of human lives. And I would say that in terms of what happens after Stonewall, now in the first place, off and off off Broadway really become places where um, depictions of gay and lesbian characters become increasingly, I would say, increasingly real and honest. Um, not to say that every single production that happened after Stonewall got it right. Not to say that every single one was um, sort of what we would consider right now to be, you know, exactly politically kind of woke in the way that uh, the, in the way that people are striving to make their productions now to to really sort of work with realism and to reflect accurately um, different communities and different perspectives. But at the time, it was fairly important that off off Broadway and off Broadway, we start seeing more productions um, that are reflective of uh, gay lives and gay attitudes. Now, um, when it comes to Broadway, there was actually not an immediate uh, success with this. Um, the, 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 really, the first production on Broadway that was a huge hit that, fi that, that featured gay men just kind of living and loving uh, and and leading their lives was was La Cage a Faux in in 1983 I think or 1984, and that kind of says something. I mean that's quite a way after Stonewall, and yet it takes all of this time for on Broadway the Broadway musical to reflect gay men, and that show actually came up against a great deal of criticism in some ways in the sense that. Um, you know, it's sort of a big budget Broadway musical. It makes a lot of jokes at the expense in certain ways of, of gay people and gay culture. Um, at the same time, however, it was written by uh, Harvey Firestein. It was written by a gay man. It was written with the aim of educating the populace, of educating the public. So kind of inviting a mainstream audience to come and learn that here are two gay men. They love one another. They've devoted their lives to one another. They've raised a child. They are happy. They, they, they want, they choose to live their lives together and they live their lives well together. And so that says a great deal, um, first of all, about how slow culture moves, unfortunately, but also about the fact that there are these attempts to at least increase the, um, the the to increase the the um sympathy i guess in terms of depictions and not just vilify or mock uh other examples that come to mind i mean there were shows that were attempted on broadway that probably belonged in the off or off off broadway realm at the time but there was a musical as early as the mid 1970s uh sextet was a musical that didn't do well on Broadway. It made too many, it was compared too often to company. It was very similar in certain ways to company, but it was basically a dinner party um, of six, uh, six people, so three different couples. It was an older straight couple, a younger straight couple, and then a younger gay male couple. And the six of them meet one night for a dinner party, and they variously all kind of question their relationships and question their connections and question their uh, gender identities. And so there are attempts, at least on Broadway, to um, work with and tangle with the changing times that I would say was not done quite as well as was done off-Broadway. Now, off-Broadway and off-off-Broadway, you see a tremendous amount, um, a, a real um, uptick of 
depictions of gay and lesbian characters that once again um, are that, that once again, well, first of all, are being developed actually by, in many cases, gay and lesbian uh, playwrights and directors and producers and people who are trying to reflect the scene as um, it's as it is kind of uh, developing, right, uh, in New York City and beyond. Uh, during the post post Stonewall years, and I'm thinking of there are productions like Al Carmine's um, at the Judson Poets did a production in the early 1970s called The Faggot, uh, which was one of the first commercial musicals to run off off Broadway, and then it actually did so well off off Broadway that it moved to a larger off Broadway theater, uh, and it ran for some time in the early 1970s where. Um, it was basically a number of different vignettes that depicted gay life and the struggles of gay men and women um, trying to find connection, trying to find understanding, trying to find acceptance in the broader world. And so there are shows that you start to see right after Stonewall that do reflect uh, the changing movement and the direction that the LGBT community starts to go both politically and socially following Stonewall in the in the post Stonewall years. So yes, um, it's it's slow, but it's definitely there. So you mentioned um, the boys in the band uh, actually making its Broadway debut just last year. Um, how do you mm-hmm. see the musical landscape now? Uh, you, I mean, you, you sort of mentioned right, it goes slowly. Do you feel like there is now Broadway representation? Um, Absolutely. And, or, or is there still um, a bit of stigma or and a, and a bit of joking around, right, where they're maybe played for laughs or anything like that? I, I would say that it's both. And I would also say that it has to be both, certainly in the mainstream. I mean, the commercial marketplace is such that you are um, aiming for and trying to appeal to an enormous uh, population, an enormous number of people who um, – do not necessarily go to Broadway for an education, sometimes want to go to Broadway to see themselves reflected, sometimes want to go to Broadway just because here they are in New York City and they've never been to a Broadway musical and they and they just kind of want to see what that's about. And so, and then a number of people that really go regularly and want to see varying perspectives. Um, I would say that certainly depictions of uh, LGBTQ people are... Um, constantly evolving the way that the commercial theater is evolving. And so there are shows, and I would say that, you know, different um, different audiences are appealed to in different ways. So, for example, you know, Kinky Boots uh, is a musical that in some ways is along the Lacage model in that it is ultimately rather safe. It is something that is ultimately family-friendly, that that is very gentle with its gender politics, but that teaches really good moral lessons. It's very moving. It's all about community. It's all about learning to understand difference. Um, And so that's kind of a very different show than, for example, um, Boys in the Band, which did run last year on Broadway for the first time, or something like uh, Fun Home, which is you know, sort of celebrated as one of the first musicals to uh, really hone in on and depict the emotional and uh, developmental life of a, and and the family life of a butch lesbian, um, honestly and with, with clear eyes and in deeply sympathetic ways that don't, not only doesn't pull any punches, but also doesn't try to diminish or to demean in any way. Uh, However, I would say that different audiences are going to be drawn to different kinds of productions. But I would also say that it is – and then The Prom, of course, is another show that's that's kind of – you know, in some ways it's a very inside um, – show it's 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 about the industry it's about broadway itself it's kind of an old fashioned musical but then again it is kind of depicting changing times it's about a you know a, a a group of broadway people that go to a small town because a girl there wants to go to the prom with her girlfriend and uh the 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 community is not so um accepting of that right and 
there are, I think, various different kinds of productions that are going to, again, appeal to different kinds of people, but that generally speaking, uh, the reflection is, is, I mean, certainly compared to 100 years ago or even 60 years ago, 50 years ago, really, I think, going in the right direction. And I think that you are seeing more and more in the way of depictions. There's certainly more conversation within the uh, industry, among casting agents, among people that study Broadway, about the importance of having representation not only on the stage but behind the scenes, of including, um, oh, uh, of of considering people for roles who actually have the lived experience, and that that extends not only just to gay, lesbian, uh, pop the, the LGBTQ population, but to you know, for example, the disability population, the various different groups of people who are. Um, uh, living experiences that they're being asked to play on on stage, right? So I would say that things are changing very much for the better, uh, slowly but surely, certainly. I think a, a little bit of optimism is something we can all use. I mean, just seeing that there are, um, you know, spaces that we can tell our stories and, and that, you know, stories can be told is so important, and it's definitely – enlightening to, to see those changes and shifts in the last few years um, right. to the, a wider audience, right? I mean, would would Fun Home have been as successful as it was or and is even 10, you know, maybe, maybe 20 years ago? Oh, um, no, absolutely not. You know, yeah. It's like, it's a, but it's such a fine line, you know. It's like it, it came out right at the right moment when people were both ready for it and I think also wanting it. Right. But what I would add, by the way, is that it, it remains important. You know, I'm a huge advocate for off and off, off Broadway. I, I really think that the commercial theater, um, I, not to say that I don't love Broadway. I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a big theater person. I love to go to the theater and I love all of the different realms of theater. But what I think is really important is that very often I would say that what were once upon a time controversial themes on Broadway uh, were really challenged and changed by the presence of queer people making theater off and off, off Broadway in the first place. And that has existed for a very long time. I think it took Stonewall and it took a greater presence, a greater, um, much more in the way of ramped up political activism, a redirection of the, you know, sort of like moving out from, out of the closet and into the streets, as it were, right? To, um, to to educate the populace, to educate the public about what equality means and what inclusion means. But this was material that really was happening in more experimental spaces for a very long time. The fact that it's taken as long as it has to bubble up into the mainstream is in a lot of ways sort of typical of the mainstream. It takes a long time if you think of any fashion, if you think of any, you know, generally most things start in some little enclave where people are taking risks and they are expressing themselves very frankly and very honestly. And the general population says, okay, well, that's so interesting. Yeah, well, we don't care about that. We want to go see this other thing. But then after a while, those ideas kind of take on more weight and they take on more meaning as more and more people learn and grow and develop. And then finally, when the, you know, sort of the mass marketplace can support these ideas as ideas that people don't even challenge, that's a wonderful thing. So I know that, you know, I don't mean to sound negative in saying like, oh, it takes such a long time. Of course it takes a long time, but once it takes hold, it's a, it's a fantastic thing. So I think that Broadway has responded very well in the ways it should and in ways that I don't think it was capable of of doing before Lacage or during the age of sextet, right? I mean, everything really did still have to be couched and shaded and, and, and sort of kept in, in sort of uh, kind of a double meaning, kind of a double entendre sort of place so that people could interpret what they wanted to see if they wanted to see it, but not everybody was ready for that. You know, an example that comes to mind is actually Company from the early, early 1970s, Stephen Sondheim's musical, which was uh, a big Hal Prince, Stephen Sondheim production about a 35-year-old bachelor who never gets married, right? He doesn't want to get married and all of his friends are married. And 
Stephen Sondheim has forever gone on record, um, as did George Firth, who wrote the, the book. Um, both of them gay men. Both of them said, no, Bobby was not supposed to be gay. Bobby is not gay. There's nothing. Bobby is absolutely not gay. This is the main character who doesn't get married, right? He's not gay. But what is kind of remarkable about this production is that so many gay men saw themselves in Bobby. They they basically, oh, look, there's a 35-year-old man who's resistant to getting married, and all of his friends want him to get married to a woman. And look at that. He doesn't want to do that. Gee, I wonder why, right? So the, the ability to be able to start um, – seeing yourself in in increasingly mainstream places is a really exciting, really important, really relevant thing that is so Sondheim can go on record and say all he wants. Bobby's not supposed to be gay. Many, many, many people started seeing Bobby as gay, as a gay man, a gay character, because, you know, I think that in a lot of ways, the increased need for presence and the increased demand for presence that Stonewall allowed for, that, that Stonewall really sort of prompted, uh, was was fairly immediate, fairly important, and that didn't go away. That hasn't stopped. That's, you know, that's why uh, now there's, there's same-sex marriage. You know, that's a wonderful, but that is sort of what began uh, with the redirection that Stonewall brought the culture. Yeah, I think we're at a really fun time for art um, in the open sense of the word. Uh, I would hope we so. have opportunities. <laughs> yeah, I think there are definitely opportunities to be more realistic and to just be more open about what your story is, why you're writing it, what your inspirations were. We're, we're certainly at a point uh, in culture where we have more opportunity to be sincere and be authentic and I think I'm looking forward to that uh, in our art, most of all. I would hope so, yeah. And to challenge one another, to to kind of keep telling one another. I mean, it. I I think that having debates about, uh, you know, should should gay people play gay characters, and can straight people play gay characters? Can non-disabled people play disabled characters, or should it only be disabled people who play disabled characters? Um, this is a really active, very broad, very far-reaching conversation that's happening in the arts right now. And I do also, I mean, I continue to think that without uh, big movements that begin with big um, or I shouldn't say begin, but big movements that are sort of prompted along by big actions like Stonewall uh, really allow for healthier debate and for a, a evolution on a grand cultural scale. So I would agree with you. I don't think there's a whole lot to be happy about right now in the world, but the arts are thriving, and I, it's it's very nice to see. Well, this was a really interesting conversation. Um, it is making me want to go back and watch a whole lot of musicals from the 60s and 70s. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, so thank you, uh, Elizabeth, for joining us today. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Our next guest is Micah Salkine, Special Projects Manager for the City of Providence Department of Art and Adjunct Assistant Professor of the Humanities at Brown University. He is the author of Do You Remember House? Chicago's Queer of Color Undergrounds. Here with us to examine how Stonewall influenced and intersected with Chicago's own LGBTQ movement and art scene. Welcome to the Oxford Comment. I'm Caitlin Phillips. Uh, we're here today with Micah Salkine. Uh, Michael, could you give us a brief introduction of yourself? Sure, Caitlin. I am an interdisciplinary scholar that thinks a lot about place, culture, and identity. And I'm also an arts administrator in Providence, Rhode Island. I just wrote a book Great. as well. Yeah. <laughs> is that is yeah. that germane to this? <laughs> yeah. So I just published a book with Oxford called uh, Do You Remember How it's Chicago's Queer of Color Undergrounds? How did the individuals involved in the LGBTQ rights movement in Chicago specifically express themselves through art, music, and dance? And then how did that expression form and embolden a sense of community for them? You know, one of the really interesting things that I found in my research about Chicago was that there was this alliance that took shape on the South Side between a group of students at the University of Chicago and black activists who were fighting for gay rights. And that alliance kind of begot all kinds of new cultural work that was happening in the city. And, you know, my focus has been on underground queer nightlife. And in many ways, that that nightlife that I'm interested in, that, that underground disco scene that begot house music culture, was 
formed in opposition to a, a kind of mainstream gay disco culture that took shape on the city's north side. So a lot of the work that I was interested in researching was actually cultural work that was in reaction to the racism of, of white gay discotheques. A lot of the ways that I understand activism and sort of the, the gay rights movements of Chicago have, have has been framed by this idea of kind of not just racial antagonisms, but kind of like coalescence and then separation and, and really how queer people deal with the legacies of um, segregated spaces in, in a city that's, you know, kind of, it's a cliche uh, to refer to Chicago as a hyper-segregated city, but, you know, those, those legacies are really intense there. How did space and geography of Chicago sort of affect these artistic communities? One of the really interesting things about Chicago is it's kind of been a hub of independent media production for probably almost a century now at this point. And so when the underground discotheques that I was interested in writing about, so the queer of color spaces in the South Loop, which begot like kind of these teen spaces um, and spaces in the West Loop neighborhoods, which are kind of adjacent to the city center, those a lot of those industrial spaces where people were were throwing events and producing all ages nonprofit juice bars, which you know it's really interesting to think about that as a legal structure that enabled the efflorescence of house music culture. Those spaces that they were using had been used for light industry. Some of them in the South Loop had actually been used by independent record labels that had flourished in the 60s prior to the kind of creaming of talent and the decimation of the indie labels by mainstream record labels out of LA and New York. So what's really cool is there's this kind of spatial continuity between older sites of musical and cultural ferment and the kind of newer queer of color sites of experimentation and underground spatial kind of formations that took shape in the in the late 70s and early 1980s. So your work is sort of late 70s, early 80s, but can you, you know, talk maybe a little bit about what Chicago maybe looked like during the Stonewall riots of, of 69, you know, or maybe the legacy that they left? You know, did the the spaces that you're sort of talking about, right, did finding your own space and everything, were they inspired by the Stonewall riots? Um, did they see them sort of taking their their control and their space back? You know, what what really was the reaction um, to those? Right. Yeah, I think what's interesting about the Stonewall riots is, you know, clearly they've had incredible um, ripples on, on on a national scale, right? So Chicago is not unaware of what's happening in in the Village and in New York at the time. But you know, there are these things that are happening in cities all across the United States, and I think one of the things that I try to do in my work is really recognize the development of house music culture in the mid to late 70s as what the late DJ Craig Cannon called Chicago's Stonewall, right? So it wasn't necessarily that Chicagoans were thinking about their own cultural work in isolation from a national movement for gay rights that was really catalyzed in many ways by the Stonewall riots, but, you know, in in many ways, like activists in San Francisco and the Compton cafeteria riots there in the 60s, you know, there there was a lo- this, these local flashpoints that really catalyzed cultural movements like the house music movement, and they had their own kind of local cultural dimension. So, you know, Chicago in 1979 had the disco demolition at Comiskey Park, which was the, you know, is, is still the ballpark where the, the White Sox play. And that was a kind of very well-known harbinger of the end of what, you know, mainstream cultural critics have called the disco era, where a Chicago radio DJ on a, on a rock radio station blew up a huge pile of disco records and, and just R&B and other black music in the middle of Comiskey Park. So a lot of people talk about that event, actually, as being the kind of moment in which you get this shift into the real vitality and critical importance of these underground queer of color spaces, because it's this huge huge rebuke to black Latino and gay dancing communities who are the primary audiences of disco. So people really talk about disco demolition as in the same ways they talk about the assassination of Fred Hampton. So this kind of cultural assassination of a music that required a cultural response. So, you know, in terms of Stonewall, the event in New York, I think my interviewees, these 60 oral history interviews, my interviewees spoke not at all about that, but they did use the language of like, this was our stone wall. You know, Chicago House was the stone wall of our community. It's so interesting that you're talking about the, you know, the disco blow up as sort of being this attack on queer culture. I, I have never looked at it through that lens before. It always 
framed, I feel like, by by history as sort of like, oh, cool rock and roll won. More brainy rock and roll won, right? Like disco was so dumb and it was so basic. Yeah, it's also, you know, I don't want to imply that there weren't in the early 70s, you know, the historian Timothy Stewart Winters done great work on, you know, things like the Chicago Liberation Dance and the protests that enabled the city to have gay bars in the first place in the early 70s that where, where people could, could dance with same-sex partners. So I don't want to imply that that wasn't taking place, but I think that those were whiter movements and they were North Side movements and, and, and thinking about sort of queer people of color and how they fit into those movements. I think they were always essential. I think they were leaders. So people like Vernita Gray and Max Sampson and other activists who were pressuring for gay liberation in the city in the 60s and into the 70s. I don't want to minimize their work. And and I think another really interesting thing that I found in my research is that there were informal parties being thrown, pride parties being thrown, kind of black pride parties at the beach on Lake Michigan, right near Boys Town in the Lakeview neighborhood that were actually started by black lesbians and over time, they became more kind of mixed gender and more associated with just black pride in general and not sort of black lesbian pride as a these activist spaces that were, you know, claiming space at the Belmont Beach, which is called the Belmont Rocks. That was a really important kind of site of black queer cultural development that has a complex history that's not just Stonewall happened and then there was space that was claimed. It's been contested over time. And so I think rethinking these these cultural moments of visibility and kind of cultural rupture as ones where there's kind of sometimes two steps forward, one step back, or there's multiple kind of competing claims for recognition and viability that are swirling all in the mix. So when you work through this stuff in a largely historical monograph, like you can get into some of the, the textures of that and, and the nuances and sort of the messiness of it, which is really exciting. Yeah, it's amazing how flat history gets. And I think that you are making a really, you know, important point in that Stonewall gets assigned as being the the only catalyst, and it just sort of maybe was the loudest, or you know, because it's New York, it got covered, or you know, whatever the reasoning yeah. was. Yeah, New York it almost becomes like a part that stands in for the whole of national gay politics. When you know, and there's been a lot of scholars that have done work on even the kind of development of rural queer spaces that totally get minimized in the way that we think about the kind of urbanity of gay culture, there's just so much work to be done. But I think even to just take a perspective on like, well, what was happening in the Midwest or what was happening in Chicago helps sort of expand our understandings of what are the, not just the continuities, but also the the kind of frictive moments in those historical ruptures where, you know, there's been so much interesting work over the past couple of years, artistic work coming out, you know, people like Raina Gossett, Tourmaline, whose Happy Birthday Marsha film about activist Marsha P. Johnson and the sort of recuperation of trans women of color's history and pivotal role in the, the Stonewall riots, but also queer women and non-gender conforming people in general. So I think that in the rush to sort of like lionize and to make legible this kind of like moment that can be celebrated, it, it, you, you know, you run the risk of covering over the, the messy complexity that makes our communities so vibrant, vital, and innovative. Yeah, there's always this instinct to sort of make it a palatable to all people, but it sort of maybe minimizes it in some ways, right? I mean, I feel like there was a push to remind everybody that it was Marsha who threw the first rock, right? And who really um, was the bold one and, and stepped out. And, and that was not something that I feel like gets incorporated into Stonewall conversations up until recently. And, and took people saying, hey, let's not lose the reality just because it makes some people uncomfortable, you know, right. report history right. the way that it happened. You know, and, and also how do we open our minds to understanding collect- collectivities that are amorphous and shifting and, and don't, you know, do we always need to have these kind of hagiographic histories where we have to connect with this one figure and that if we don't see ourselves in that figure, then we don't understand the importance of the movement? How do we like find ways of identifying and also disidentifying with moments in our histories that are messy and hard to comprehend? And I think, you know, one of the things that's been really exciting about my research is just digging into this particular artistic movement, you know, gives me insight into the ways that, oh, like 
artists actually have great ways of dealing with this complexity. It requires critics and scholars and, and audiences to really do the work of interpreting and making sense of that artistic work. But like, there's this great possibility for a dialectic between art that comes out of revolution and then critique and then more art. You know, so that kind of process, I hope that Do You Remember House is part of that kind of generative world-making process of, of doing the interpretive work so that people can make more art to respond to the continually difficult conditions of being a queer person of color, being a queer person who's non-gender conforming. Clearly, there's so much work to do that I think we need continually like renew our approaches and, and also not forget how effective the activism and artistic production of our foremothers and forefathers and ancestors has been to making this all possible. Yeah, I, I, that is a really beautiful summation of it, uh, is just how important art is you know, to these movements. I think art is so important because it is open-ended. Like writing an academic monograph creates a certain kind of punctuation mark in a conversation. Art creates an ellipsis, right? Like, so the art leaves room for more voices. It opens up. I mean, I hope that I'm opening up more discourse and dialogue, not shutting it down. Um, That's not the intention at all. I'm always following the artists. I want to see how they respond. Uh, Writing about artists is incredibly exciting and certainly being in their midst and working with them and collaborating with them even more so. You know, we've lost a lot of artists to HIV AIDS. We continue to lose them, but we remember them and we and we celebrate them and we are influenced by them still. So there's so much more to come. And I think we're at a really interesting crossroads where the best is in many ways yet to come. Well, Micah, it was absolutely a pleasure to talk with you. I could certainly listen to you wax about all of this probably for the whole afternoon. So thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks, Caitlin. We want to thank our featured guests, Elizabeth Woolman, author of Hard Times, and Micah Salkine, author of Do You Remember House, for joining us on this episode of The Oxford Comment. As always, we would like to thank the crew of The Oxford Comment for their continued assistance on each episode. Be sure to follow The Oxford Comment on Facebook and Twitter to stay up to date on upcoming podcast episodes. Also, please don't forget to subscribe to The Oxford Comment on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. I'm Caitlin Phillips. Thank you for listening.